you know, in this environment, project management, building companies and stuff, it's a volatile environment. There's a lot of change. Uh, there's a lot of unforeseen stuff. It's really best to shorten the, the cycle of, of planning and actual uh, reviewing the data and the outcomes of those plans and pivoting. It's all, I think it, that's a very big component of it is, is being able to pivot and adapt to change quickly. So you're going to set these big lofty goals like we do in projects, a big lofty timeline, but that timeline's going to change in about 17 times before you get to the end of that. So putting up the, the iteration cycle there and um, get feedback from your actions that you're taking and adjust your plan along the way. Welcome to the Beyond Deadlines podcast, where we tackle challenges that planning and scheduling leaders face on a day-to-day -day basis. My name is Micah Pipo, and I'm a planning manager for Intel. Hello, everyone. My name is Kyle Nitchin. I'm a senior project manager at Layton Construction, and I'm also the author of a weekly newsletter called The Influential Project Manager, where we talk about project leadership. And it is a great newsletter, folks. If you're going to subscribe, there will be links into the show notes. Today, we're going to dive into leadership challenges. So, Kyle, you're on the hot seat. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's do it, Micah. Absolutely. So you have been hired as the VP of construction at a large general contractor. The contractor has said their main issues are delivering projects on time, and they feel that it's rooted in a cultural issue. They've having challenges across the leadership spectrum, and they've brought you in to address this challenge. How do you go about doing it? Great question. Um, so VP, new construction company, I'm walking in. Uh, I guess the first thing I'm going to do is peel back and I'm going to think about or talk to the other senior leaders and figure out the purpose. What's our, what's our goal? I'm going to get, I'm going to get clear on what these challenges are, where we're going, who's on the team and what our mission is. I want to make sure that's crystal clear so we know what direction we're going to go. From there, I'm going to embody what I want to see others do, right? That's the first thing. I'm going to look myself in the mirror and say, okay, how do I want my people to act? What kind of actions, what kind of behaviors do we want that's going to get us to that mission that we first got clear on? And I'm going to lead by example so I can influence these people all right so leadership is really influence it's nothing more it's nothing less it's influencing the behaviors and the habits and the actions that you want to see to get a mission done through a group of people so i think those are the first two things i'm going to do get clear on the mission get clear on the direction and then start communicating to the people to get everyone rallied around that mission and make sure that they understand the why behind that mission so that they can attach to it, they can latch onto it. And then from there, I'm gonna embody, I'm gonna lead by example. I'm going to put others first. I'm going to give instead of take. I'm going to um, first, you know, lead by example. That's that's what I'm gonna do. Yeah, yeah, so let's, uh, I'll throw out, how about this? I'll throw out a hypothetical mission. And then you can tell me if it's good or bad, or if you'd modify it. So let's say this GC said their mission is they want to be the leader in new hospital construction across North America. Is mm -hmm. that a good mission to start with? What would you change? Uh, it's not clear enough. No, the leader in hospital construction, does that mean the highest revenue uh, the one that has the most hospitals or the best customers, or do you want to be the biggest healthcare builder in California? Do you want to do it in in the country? It's still not clear enough. What kind of projects do you want to be? Do renovations, new builds? Um, do you want to have the most amount of projects, or do you want to have the you want to grow your company at a steady pace? Um, so it's really kind of peeling back and getting a little bit more clear than that. And 
why would you get more clear on that? How does that help you then push that mission forward, you know, across your leadership plan? Because, um, you know, in construction and what we do, um, it's really client based, right? So you could work for, you Mm -hmm. could be a big hospital builder and just have a bunch of not so good clients or not so good projects. You have to select these and hand pick these out um, uh, pretty carefully and and with clarity or else they could, you know, projects are risky and they could, they could go bad. And one project could set you back from your true overall mission. Do you want to have a company that's, um, you know, working for good clients and people enjoy working there or, or these clients where, they're running unrealistic timelines and super demanding and um, projects are just, uh, you know, unrealistic from the get go. So I think that's that's why it's important is is you could being the biggest and the, and the best is not always the best. It's easy to think that maybe, but I think that, you know, uh, being working for the best clients or working on the best projects, which not every project is, is, is more important. Yeah, no, that's a, I think also hundreds of my listeners, when you brought up unrealistic timelines, they're like, Kyle, I know exactly what you're talking about. You're speaking to my soul because I'm out there planning and scheduling a project right now that has zero hope of being delivered on time. Yeah. Okay. So let's say you crafted this mission statement, you're starting to embody uh, as a leader. What is that next step? Let's say you have a, like an in-flight or two project and you have a couple big upcoming future projects. How are you going to then you know, take this out to the streets, if you will, and kind of start driving this mission forward and your leadership style across the organization? Well, I think the next step after you got the mission, after you're, you, you know, you got a goal, you'd create some sort of strategic plan, right? What does the next uh, six months look like? What are our KPIs that we're going to hit on that time? What are the ha- the new things that we're going to do? So kind of creating a strategic little initiative. And it's you're going to have some zero to six month plan, maybe a six to 12 month plan, and then a one to five. And then you're going to you're going to simply execute. You're going to go execute. You're going to start executing. You're going to sit, then uh, maybe pause for a second, reorientate yourself, see how see how that worked out for you and adjust and pivot along the way. So there's a lot of, um, you know, in this environment, project management, building companies and stuff, it's a volatile environment. There's um, there's a lot of change. Uh, there's a lot of unforeseen stuff. Um, so it's really best to shorten the, the cycle of, of planning and actual uh, reviewing the data and the outcomes of those plans and pivoting. It's all, I think it, that's a very big component of it is is being able to pivot and adapt to change quickly. So you're going to set these big lofty goals like we do in projects, a big lofty timeline, but that timeline is going to change and about 17 times before you get to the end of that. So shorten up the, the iteration cycle there and um, get feedback from your actions that you're taking and adjust your plan along the way. So I think uh, that would be my answer to that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just getting a little bit tactical and into the weeds, because I always like to understand the different sorts of, uh, you know, what people use when they go do these sorts of strategic plans, because I think it varies across the industry. So would this mm-hmm. be, you know, a presentation, a document, a combination? You know, what's your kind of go to as you look to lay out that strategic plan? You know, how are you framing that up to share it with executives and then also the people beneath you who are going to, have to go help you execute that plan? Yeah, I think it'd be a combination of a few things. Um, first, I think the leader themselves would probably want to write the plan out themselves so they're, they're crystal clear on it. And then, yeah, some sort of presentation to get people on board. Um, and to communicate that plan. And then you're probably going to have, I guess, if we want to go like real tactical, tactical, um, some sort of, um, software or platform where this plan lives and that you can go and review it 
and update it frequently. I always say, you know, the value is in the planning and not the plan. Okay, that's one of the, the thing that I, I live by on projects and in companies. Um, and what that means is the plan is just where you store the conversations from your planning sessions. A plan is static. Uh, planning is active. And the value is in the action. So something that you can revisit frequently and update um, is, is a, like a platform like a, one I use is Miro. Miro is a great yeah, tool. Miro is awesome. Um, yeah, for that. I, I store plans in there, something we can pop into. Go back to what we talked about the the everything from the biggest biggest mission down to the the nitty gritty stuff that that leads up to that. Highly visual as well too. I love it because it's highly visual. It's visual. You know, you don't need to be <laughs> a, a five ten year planner to understand page twelve on a PDF Gantt chart to figure out where it's at. It's it's just right there. You're flying around. It's very collaborative. Exactly. Trello is another good one too for yeah. for storing conversations and um, and executing plans and tracking, uh, you know, who's doing what. That's awesome. So you mentioned something that is I don't know. Some may call it a little contrarian, but the the micro pivot, if you will, where you're adjusting and tweaking the plan. Oftentimes in construction, you get this view of. And I think this view goes, starts from the project side, which I don't feel is probably necessarily cor correct, but then also transitions over to what I'll call like the operational side when you're doing the cultural change, the leadership change, the process changes, right? And it's that kind of like, I'm going to give you a baseline and it's never going to change for two years until it's delivered. But what you're saying, there's going to be tweaks and changes along the way. So my question is, how do you establish that with your stakeholders and the people you're working with early enough and then build an environment where that becomes the norm where people are used to that because i don't feel necessarily if you drop that into a lot of places people will be ready for all right we're going to micro change micro pivot along the way yeah um how do you how do you establish that you got to communicate it early the earlier, the better. Setting us expectation, clear expectations from from the beginning. Like this is the plan, guys. But here is also the change management plan. Now, I, if if somebody can't understand that a project is going to have change, then I'm not sure exactly where they're coming from. To be honest, then you might just have yeah. to help them understand this. This change is not a matter of uh, if it's a matter of when, right? Um, so you might have to communicate the why or, or help them understand that. And so then from there, you're gonna we're gonna talk about the change management plan and how we're gonna pivot. We're not gonna say that hey, if if there's a two year deadline on this on this particular project or initiative, and we want to stick to that, fine, let's stick to it. Let's commit to it with everything we got. But how we get there might change along the way um and that's essentially like we we do that in construction it's called the last planner system um you know we don't go in and change milestones but we we work backwards from milestones and the the schedule may change and look a little bit different once the last planners get involved um but the milestones stay the same you know, the goals should stay the same, but the how can change and that should change. Um, you know, a, a schedule and a plan at the very beginning of an initiative is just a, is just a guess. It's just a, it's a, just an educated guess. And it's just, it's just something that forecasts the demand of, of your project, not necessarily the production of your project or your initiative, um, which is the how. Yeah. So let's say you have the strategic plan and you're starting to drive forward on it and you're getting a good change. You're, you're, let's say you've hit a couple project teams, they're on board with it. And then you get to one project team that has a project, I don't know, it's kicking off in six months and they're in the initial planning cycle. Yeah. And they're like, you know, flat out, they're not saying it to your face, but you're reading between the tea leaves. We hate Kyle. We don't want him. We don't want any of this new process. We don't want any of this new change. Just go away. How are you mm -hmm. going to tackle that? 
uh, challenge and get that team on board and get them part of this change you're trying to orchestrate? Mm. Uh, first thing I would do is look in the mirror. What, what, am I doing something wrong? Okay, let me understand this situation. I'm not going to go in and and start blaming and dictating and saying there's something. First of all, is what they're doing working? Is it is it aligning with the mission? Is it aligning with the goals? Yes. Okay, then maybe I should leave them alone and just let them do their thing. Yeah, maybe no? they're just like a little couple degrees to the right. But it's still, like you said earlier in your point, like it's still going to eventually roll down and finish at the same. Is that what you're kind of saying? Yeah. Like maybe if, they're like a couple degrees off from what you're exactly saying, but it's rolling in the right direction. It's rolling in the right direction. What they're doing, maybe their client's happy. Nothing. If there's no issue, then I'm not going to create, you know, unnecessary change if they're enjoy, truly enjoying themselves and and having fun and and making money and and doing all things that they probably should do maybe they're just not doing it my way that's fine i rather you know in leadership it's important to give people ownership and and for me to tell people how to do things um and just dictate the way they should do things then they're not going to take ownership of all of a sudden it becomes my plan it's not theirs i rather be theirs and they own that thing they're going to see way more results that way when they own the plan. Um, so that's good. But on the other flip side, say it's not working, their <laughs> client's not happy, and they're still resistant to change, well, then I might need to come in and do some coaching. And I just say, guys, let's start with the why. Let me help you understand this, okay? Because clearly this is not working, what you're doing. It's not aligning with our, our company's mission our strategic initiative. So let me help you understand. And I'm going to paint the picture. Here's the why. Here's the vision. Here's what the, here's what it means for you. Okay. So that's one thing I do. Under Number two, I don't try and understand their personalities. Okay. I'm going to understand who they are. I'm going to understand who, what drives them, what motivates them, you know, and then I'm going to speak and act and try and, um, I'm going to try and, uh, cater to those okay so like you know i'm going to understand their disc personality i understand if they're what what makes them uh light up what makes them uh how do i influence these people right and then if that's the if none, none of that does work then i will look for a, a change in people you know because you can't fix a people issue no no amount of planning can fix a people issue i've learned that the hard way so, um, but that's what I'm going to, I'm always going to start with why I'm going to always start with the vision and I'm going to tie it, get them to latch onto that thing and then make them own the plan, help, help them own the plan. Yeah. I think what I've seen is when you, that ownership transfers, you also ignite the spark of innovation in people. You know, yeah. it's like, it's like when you transfer something over and you pass it across the table, then all of a sudden they take it and make it something that you may not have seen or take it to another level or apply it in a different way. I mean, is that another benefit yeah. that you say of that kind of transferred ownership? It's like, it kind of grows a whole new life for them as well. Yes. It's beautiful. Uh, humans love that. We love that. We love the freedom and um the you know the the ownership that comes with with having it be theirs all of a sudden it's like they they reach new new levels of of drive new levels of innovation like you're seeing and honestly they may be they may figure out a way that's to do it that's better than your way i mean it's it's like magic yeah any uh, any sorts of you know tips tricks and tactics you've learned along the way to kind of help spark a bit more of that innovation i know i was working on a site and we were trying to improve scheduling and planning and at a certain point i realized okay we got a couple different groups here that are trying to all get better together well you know what if we create like a silly competition almost 
based on the agreed metrics we set to, right? We got a mission to get better at scheduling. It was a bit more you know, descriptive than that. Um, but we'd set mm -hmm. up our goal of like, hey, we want to get over 80% PPC. Um, and so we're going to set up, you know, a silly little, you know, competition. And at first I was like, you know, as we set that up, I was like, yeah, this might work. This might not. And then people got really into it. Just, you know, just the kind of competitiveness of, hey, we're out here. We're going to try and make it, try and get better. And it really started to work. And and the crazy part, there is no monetary award involved. It's just like, you know, like it's like in the football game when the guy makes the tackle and they hand him the, the WWE belt, right? Like that's mm -hmm. kind of what we were talking about. Is there any sorts of things that are coming up in your mind that you've either experienced or done that, that kind of gets that camaraderie and that innovation going? Yeah. Yeah, you're speaking to a very important point. You're you're speaking to culture. Um and and yeah, let's talk about some of those tactics. So first like when you want to establish as a leader a, a high performing culture, right? So that's like the kind of culture you hopefully want to establish amongst your team. Um that you know, we're here to win, we're here to do a great job, provide a great service, and this all starts with you leading the way, right? You're not going to go telling people to do this. You're going to just do it and then people will will much more gravitate towards those types of behaviors when they see it in in, in the leader. Um so yeah, anytime I can, I'm going to try and create a, a scoreboard on 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 what we're doing. So it's a scoreboard. Weird how that works. Isn't yeah. that weird how just everyone's like innate, even the people who you don't think are very competitive, you throw that thing up and it's like it's on. <laughs> Boom. Yeah, like a scoreboard anytime you can. PPC, great. Let's put it let's put it on the office and let's let's not beat people up with it. Let's yeah. just let's just try and be good, guys. Let's try and deliver a great service. And remember, this is about, you know, providing great service and, and winning like, we're here to win like i'm trying to yeah. be the best like we are trying to be the best so that's the that's the culture and the attitude um and if there's a few things you can do some things i've done in the past um to kind of help this culture grow um we start book clubs like that make oh, yeah. it clear to people that um we want to grow and become better right as a team and so we started a book club and what do we do? We created a scoreboard for that. So we would have a little whiteboard in the office where we were each reading the same book. And in the office, we'd have everyone's name and what page you're on. OK, and then it came, became like a game. OK, who could read the book and get to it the fastest? And everyone, oh, oh, Kyle's on page 56. Oh, I got to I got to bump up my numbers. I'm only on page 31. Um, so we did stuff like that. And then we'd all at the end when we finish the book, we sit down, talk about it, and we talk about um, uh, how it relates to our day to day and how we can apply these, these the things that are talked about in the book. Another thing we did was we hosted monthly um, internal training sessions amongst our team, where just one person would get up in front of the group a month and and do a presentation on any topic and try and teach us something. It could just be something you wanted to learn. And you, the best way to learn is to teach it to others. And I say this because it was through these cultural things that we kind of uh, built the team that wanted to grow and wanted to do, to do great things. And then, so when we get up and do scoreboard type stuff and track people's who's doing what, you know, it's not hard to have a conversation of, hey, you need to you need to step it up a little bit, um, you know, because we're we're all trying to be the best here and, and um, you know, do great service. Those examples are are brilliant. And I, I've seen in a lot of your content and I, I'm, I would I'm totally going to butcher some of the quotes of it, but I've seen you speak before about, uh, you know, leaders aren't necessarily the people in charge. And so those examples that you brought up. You know, a lot of people might be thinking, oh, I got to wait till I'm some manager or some executive to go do, but a book club can really be set up by anybody. Uh, yeah. a, a monthly lunch and learn can be set up by anybody and orchestrated by anybody. And for anybody who's looking to climb the ladder, demonstrate different capabilities, these are pretty easy wins that you can go out and help set up and start showing that leadership capability. I mean, I, I, I think that's what i think really where your, your your mind my mind went with those examples is if 
you're out there, you can go do these things. And then you can start trying to build that career background for it. And, you know, and then if you're doing the monthly lunch and learn, maybe they'll give you something else or, you know, you can look for this different opportunity. Yeah. hundred percent, Micah. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, Kyle, we're about at time. I like to keep things short for our audience so, you know, they can do the dishes or walk the dog and be done with us. Yeah. Uh, before we take off for this week, any final thoughts? No, other than, you know, if you're in the construction industry, planning, whatever, it's, you're in a great place. And all I got to say is it's never a better time to be in this industry. Oh, I completely agree. We're building yeah. like crazy right now all over the place. All right. I will link all of Kyle's info in the show notes. If you want to feel free to dive into those links. He runs an awesome newsletter. He is active on LinkedIn. Excellent motivation. I always love when I see a Kyle uh, post pop up on my feed. I'm like, yes, this guy gets it. <laughs> so for us at Beyond Deadlines, we'll see you next week.